Hey guys, this is Ron. So this is video 14A of our series on rediscovering the C programming language. In this video, we're really gonna be talking about concurrency uh, and some of the kind of higher level, um, you know, topics that, that we'll kind of see put into action in 14B and 14C, right? So 14 is all about concurrency. 14B will, how, will be how we implement it with forking. Uh, 14C will be how we implement it with threading. So what is concurrency? So I've linked in a Wikipedia article here uh, and you're, you're more than welcome to, to take a look at it. But the thing I find most important about uh, the way they write this one up is that concurrency is the ability of different parts of a unit or units of a program, algorithm, or problem to be executed out of order or in partial order without affecting the final outcome. This allows for partial execution of the concurrent uh, units, which can significantly improve overall speed of the execution of multiprocessor and multi-core systems, right? So in this case, they're talking about breaking down a problem or a program into smaller parts and then being able to get those parts to run uh, at the same time or close to looking like they run at the same time, right? So if we had a, a processor that had you know, just a single core, um, the operating system is gonna have to switch between multiple programs running on that computer. So in our case, I'm running Vim here, I'm running Firefox, I'm running all sorts of different uh, processes. And the uh, operating system has to have some type of scheduler uh, in order to run between those processes. Well, that's great for processes, but how do we then, uh, as programmers, get our program to kind of take advantage of some of the same things, right? How do we break it down in a way um, that we can execute uh, different tasks at the same time, right? And the thing I find important here is there are oftentimes things that you can do out of order or in partial order in order to improve the speed of our program. But maybe it's not just about speed. Maybe it's it's how do I uh, communicate with multiple users at the same time? Because maybe I'm running some type of server and I have to be able to interact with multiple customers at the same time, right? And so there are aspects of our program that obviously we could break up that are gonna be redundant uh, but maybe there are other aspects of our program that are going to have to run sequentially so that, you know, the order process works, right? I charge a credit card. If that get, you know, goes through, well, then I mark an order as sold and, you know, I put out, uh, you know, some type of uh, uh, shipping order, something, right? I have to do these things in a very specific order, but I have multiple customers ordering at the same time, right? Uh, so parts of my program have to happen, uh, you know, uh, out of order, you know, and some of them have to ha happen in order, right? So this uh, Wikipedia article uh, does a, you know, a decent breakdown of what is concurrency and, and how do we think of it from a, from a computer science-y kind of way, theory, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't get too down in the weeds of this stuff, but, but again, we're talking about how do I you know, break up my program so that I can take advantage of the fact that I'm on a multi-processor or a multi-core system. Are there pro parts of my program that I can run at the same time um, and not have to worry about that kind of breaking the overall program, right? So how do I dissect my program in that way? Additionally, I put a couple more resources in here, one of which is uh, another article on concurrency, but I liked the way that they broke down what is a process, what is a thread. Um, you know, so the program is is the source code for a process or processes, right? So this is our program itself, but the process is a unit of program execution as seen by the operating systems. And the important part here is that a process has its own address space, file handles, security attributes, threads, etc. Right. Uh, the operating system prevents processes from messing with each other. So they have their own address space. And if a process tries to reach into the address space of another process, you know, the operating system says not on my watch and, sh and shuts that program down, right? 
So there's protections in place between processes and processes essentially become their own kind of islands of you know address spaces, file handles, so on and so forth. And the operating system kind of gives them access to actual resources on the system. Now, how is this different than a thread? Well, a thread is a sequential flow of control within a process. A process can contain one or more threads. Threads have their own program counter register values, but they share the memory space and other resources of the process. So a process is kind of standalone, whereas a thread, you can have multiple threads underneath of a process, and those threads all share access uh, to the same memory space and other resources. So as we're dividing up our program into multiple tasks, we can assign those tasks to different threads and those threads can go off and start executing that task. And because they all share the same memory space and resources, I only have to make those resources available once to the overall program, right? But that in and of itself can cause problems because what if two different threads try to access the same shared resource at the same time? What if they try to update a variable at the same time? Who wins, right? So there's things that we're going to have to think about as we start doing threading, right? And so multi-programming, multi-processing is the concurrent execution of several programs on one computer, right? So like I said, I have uh, I have Firefox running, I have Vim running, I have multiple processes all running, and the operating system has to take, uh, you know, take some steps to schedule time on the processor. Now, luckily, in modern day computing, we're seeing that processors are getting faster and faster, but most importantly, they're getting multiple cores, and some of those cores can also do hyper-threading. So it's in the computer that I'm currently sitting on, it's a quad core processor with hyper threading. So from the standpoint of the operating system, it, it looks like I have eight processors that it can now schedule time on each one of those processors. Um, and so it can execute concurrently uh, between different processes, right? I'm gonna schedule uh, Vim and whatever tasks it has on this core, and I'm gonna schedule you know, some remaining ones on this core, and then I'm gonna schedule some, some uh, Firefox time on this other core, and so it's able to execute multiple things at the same time, right? The next article that I have here basically gives the pros and cons of, of actual multi-core systems, right? So it gives the breakdown of, of you know, multiple cores within a system, and and how that might look. Um, and so it talks about, you know, there's some efficiency gains. You can have true concurrency. You have some performance gains. There's isolation between, uh, you know, processes and cores. Um, you have uh, some extra reliability and robustness. So, so some cool stuff in there, but given that, you have a problem with shared resources in that you know multiple things can try to access the same resources at the time at the same time and what mechanisms are going to be in place to ensure that you know they don't step on each other we can have concurrency defects so we'll talk about race conditions and deadlocks so a race condition is you know um if two threads are trying to update the same you know shared resource um which thread wins, right? And you might have a case where you thought you programmed it in such a way that um, that something would get updated only after something else had been updated, but because of a race condition, it actually gets updated early and you find yourself in a state that you didn't necessarily plan for and now you've implemented uh, a vulnerability in your program or um, you've uh, put it in a way that you know makes your program crash periodically and it's really hard you know now to troubleshoot and figure out what why did it crash because you had some weird race condition that only shows up you know every now and then right whereas like a deadlock is maybe I have a shared resource I've put in a mechanism to protect that resource uh, but somehow I did it either improperly 
or you know some other dependency in my program needs to be met before I can use said shared resource. And all of the threads that are trying to access that shared resource have to wait. And if I put myself in a place where uh, they can never access it because they're always waiting on some condition that will never become true, they're essentially stuck. And our program basically comes to a grinding halt um, and you know nothing can happen because everybody's waiting on some resource, right? And so again, there's some extra you know stuff in here. Uh, that he writes about that breaks down how these cores work and you know all this kind of stuff but i thought it was kind of uh, a good breakdown of the pros and cons of of you know multi-core uh you know multi uh, multiple processes running at the same time right so that's some high level kind of uh topics so as we start jumping into forking and threading let's uh, look at one article that kind of tries to break down what is the difference between forking and threading. So this is an article um, off of GeekRide, and so it gives some of the pros and cons of, of forking and threading. So forking is essentially breaking out uh, one process and it becomes a whole new process, right? And in doing that, well, as a whole new process, it needs to get its own address spaces, its own variables, stuff like that. Which means the original process has to copy over all of this data into the new process uh, before that process can start up. And so, great thing about it is, you know, each process has its own address space and they're kind of segmented away from each other. But again, it takes longer to spin up that process um, because it has to copy over all of that data. At the same time, what happens if one process needs to talk to another process? Well, you know, now you have to build in set some mechanism for those two processes to communicate, right? And so it kind of talks about, uh, you know, those you know positives and negatives of, of that forking process where you're creating a whole new process, right? Whereas threads, are you know, considered lightweight processes where they share these resources. Uh, so they you know, instantly can kind of share data between uh, threads, there's you know, a lot of stuff in there, but because they can all access the same re shared resources, you know, we have to you know, put in some protection mechanisms in order to, to uh, use them properly, right? And so again, pitfalls of threads, race conditions we see again, we need to make sure we have thread safe code, right? So there might be aspects of our code that uh, we have to make sure happen uh, in a specific order uh, and that, that is completed before another thread can kind of kick in and do its thing. And we'll see that there are C functions that we need to make sure are thread safe as well. So that uh, if they're relying on something in the background that we don't necessarily see, it's kind of under the hood, but is multiple um, process or multiple threads are doing things and maybe using those same functions, you know, they're doing so in a safe manner, right? And so this article kind of, you know, breaks some of those things down. All right. So, uh, forking, whole new process, copy over all the variables into the nurse, same address space. Uh, and we consider this like a parent child relationship. These, this parent and the child operate independently, which also means that they can't necessarily communicate with one another uh, without some other mechanism being put in place. Threading, right? So I linked in a picture here um, because I think this is a pretty famous kind of picture uh, that has to do with threading. But essentially it says, hey, you must be this tall to write multi-threaded code. And the reason that you know this is kind of funny but true is that multi you know writing uh, multiple threads and having them execute uh, appropriately and not starving out you know one thread or not causing uh, you know thread unsafe kind of conditions you know not getting stuck in some kind of uh, thread lock it just not easy to do right and so we have to think about these things we have to test our code uh, and still, there might be cases where we're gonna find that we uh, didn't anticipate some condition. And so again, this is just alluding to the fact that this is not an easy thing to do. 
but a thread is a lightweight process, shares the same memory of space, uh, shared same memory between uh, threads, uh, and it requires us to put in some kind of control over the shared resources, all of these shared memory kind of things. One of the controls we can put in place is a mutex. And so I put in a Wikipedia article here that covers uh, what is a lock. Uh, and so in our case, a mutual exclusion is a synchronization mechanism for enforcing limits on access to a resource in an environment where there are many threads of execution. All right, so generally, Locks are advisory locks where each lock cooperates by acquiring the lock uh, before accessing the corresponding data, right? So there are things that we can put in place and sometimes they're called semaphores. Some you'll see spin locks uh, and, and so on and so forth, right? But essentially we need some way of saying, hey, I'm gonna lock this thing and everybody else is gonna look at this lock before they go and look at some shared resource. And if this thing is currently locked, they're gonna wait until the lock becomes available. And once they're able to lock it, now they can go use that shared resource, right? And so it, there's nothing that stops necessarily, you know, uh, there's nothing that really protects that, that resource other than we have a shared agreement that, hey, before I go look at this shared resource, I'm gonna first look at the lock. And if the lock is currently locked, I'm gonna wait until it's made available, right? And so we can kind of enforce uh, that on our program, right? And we do that you know, in the logic of our program. But essentially, a mutual exclusion is a variable that holds the state of a lock. Only one thread can hold the lock at a time. The lock must be released for other threads to attempt to lock it. By forcing threads to use a lock before using a shared resource, you hopefully avoid a race condition where two threads update a shared resource at the exact same time. If we don't implement it properly, uh, we can result in a deadlock where all threads are stuck in waiting, right? So, multiple threads, not easy, but this is how most of our programs are, are going to be able to take advantage of the fact that we have a multi-core system and we can run multiple tasks at the same time. We just have to be able to, to dissect our program into uh, you know, meaningful tasks, right? So if I'm accepting connections from a bunch of customers, maybe as I accept a connection, connection I hand that connection now to a thread that basically interacts with that user. And by constantly handing that connection or each of the new connections to a different thread, uh, I essentially can have multiple customers interacting with my server at the same time. And, and they don't have to know that, you know, there's hundreds or thousands of other customers connected to the server. It looks to them like, you know, I'm interacting with the system, the system's responding to me, and so everything is, is uh, hunky-dory, right? So we're gonna cut this video right there. Just kinda wanted to get over some of the, uh, the topics surrounding uh, multi-concurrency, uh, multi-threading, forking, stuff like that. Um, and so as we get into 14B, which will cover forking, and 14C, which will cover threading, uh, we kind of already have some of these uh, in our back pocket. All right. Thank you for watching. Bye.